Chairman. Uh, the Honourable David Parker. Mr Chairman, it's not often in this House that you get the opportunity to repeat a recent speech without being accused of repetition. <laughs> but on this occasion I'm able to do so because having given my speech I was told that uh, we were then told that we were debating a different bill. <laughs> and actually on the, and I have I've made that sort of mistake before when it's been my mistake, but on this occasion it wasn't. So I think I can I can uh, I can, I, and I, of course, the minister in the chair, because um, it turned out that we were debating the uh, broadcasting, broadcasting bill rather than the uh, the electoral uh, bill, didn't have to respond to, to my comments. And I think the minister should. So, sir, I, 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 I do not think, sir, that we should be maintaining two separate uh, lists of New Zealanders that we have information about when we could actually have one. Now, virtually everyone in New Zealand who's eligible to vote has an IRD number. And uh, we know that overseas, the inland revenue roll is the basis for their electoral roll. Uh, and uh, you know, we know that superannuitants have an IRD number. We know that everyone in work uh, has an IRD number. And we know that everyone who's a beneficiary has a IRD number and everyone who has a student loan has an IRD number. Uh, we have almost a complete set of the people in New Zealand who are eligible to vote. Now there are some problems in there. There are some people who have an IRD number who are not eligible to vote. So you have to sort that through. There's a couple of ways you could do that. You could actually work out whether it's actually an important enough number to worry about. It might actually be so infinitesimally small you just ignore it uh, and just change the law to let those people vote anyway because it's not going to change the outcome. Or you could actually just require a simple declaration when you vote that says, and I am a resident or citizen or have been in New Zealand for more than one year, which I think are the, the, the um, criteria to vote and have a declaration. And if someone voted um, fraudulently in that situation, or would be just like any other um, fraudulent vote, and no doubt if there was an election outcome that came down to one vote, people would be scrutinising whether there were some, possibly some invalid votes, as it already happens where you've got a close election and people are challenging whether people were enrolled in the right, right electorate or whether their, uh, or, or whether their um, you know, vote was spoiled in some way as to mean that it ought not to have been counted. So, sir, I, I do not understand why we spend all of this money every three years uh, to create a separate list of New Zealanders when we've already got a list at the IRD. Sir, um, I've raised this on a number of occasions. I think this is a great area where we could actually improve the number of people who are eligible to vote whilst saving money for the government. Sir, what, uh, sir, um, I know, and I've heard uh, that Michael Woodhouse, Honourable Michael Woodhouse, say, "Look, you know, there, there are problems with that." But the point has to be made that some of the best democracies in the world, including Scandinavian countries, approach it on that basis. And I really think it's worthy of consideration to both save money and have better roles. I think it's becoming more and more important that we, um, as, as people uh, become less, uh, as people effectively abandon their letterboxes. People don't get much stuff through the letterbox now. Um, you know, their, their addresses are electronic. I'm not sure that we actually need to have a residential address tied to everyone. That, I might have that wrong because maybe given uh, physical constituencies, it's better, it, we need accuracy on that in advance of election day. But maybe, again, just a declaration that I live in the electorate. Or when you fill it in, you put your address in. I live at, you know, in my case, you know, 95 London Street, Dunedin. <laughs> You know, uh, when I put it in, and that qualifies me to vote there if I've got an IRD number. Some, we need to actually think some of these things uh, through again, because I think we overly complicate this. And I'm a little bit suspicious in this regard of the, um, the trend which we do see from time to time. I think we have to um, say this, although we do not have, I'm, I'm certainly not suggesting that we have a corrupt system in New Zealand, but it is true that most of the people who are itinerant or moving between three or four flats are likely to be lower income people than people who are stable at one home that they live in for the whole time. And there is a socio-economic dimension to that that means that the rules presently are 
uh, work to the benefit of those who attract the most votes from people who are better off. And of course, we know that, um, and, and, and that you know, and this is poll proven. And we all know that to be true. That in New Zealand, that just uh, Mr. Chairman, no, no, David Parker. disproportionately, those higher-income people vote for uh, the National Party or parties of the right. Uh, and uh, disproportionately, a, a larger number of the people who are at the lower income uh, to middle income groups vote uh, for the Labour Party and parties of the left. And we don't want a bias in our, the way in which we uh, have electoral outcomes based on those sorts of facts. And so we need to take special care that uh, the people who are most often disenfranchised and unable to vote actually for the health of our democracy, we, we want to make sure that they have the opportunity to vote. Now, in case the National Party was worried that that's going to change the outcome of elections in Australia, they have compulsory voting. They have a very high rate of voter turnout. It's actually something that I wonder whether other democracies are going to consider over the forthcoming years. And I don't think anyone on either side should be scared of that as an outcome, because as you see in Australia, you still get the same flip-flop from government to government as electors tire from one side and want to, ch want to, want to uh, change sides. So I don't think that, uh, that benefits any one particular side. But I do think that the legitimacy of democracies in the Western world is being undermined by the t decreasing rate of voter turnout. Uh, I think that um, the, uh, the cynicism to which politics is regarded partly because of the disintegration of current media models and the, and, and the parody which, is, uh, w which we sometimes also make so easily, you know, the, the, the fodder that we give to those that would parody us um, uh, is so much more easily exploited. Uh, fashions change uh, and as a consequence I think that there is a parlous decline in public confidence and democracy around the world. Uh, and I, for one, really believe that uh, that old saying that the only thing worse than democracy is the alternative is actually a backhanded way of saying that democracy is incredibly important. In order to maintain public confidence in democracy, we've got to maintain the highest rates of participation in elections as is possible. And we should consider any, all of the measures, whether it be compulsory voting or um, different ways that we ensure that just about everyone's in, uh, that higher proportions of the people, people, the population are enrolled. All of these things should be explored so that we can maintain public confidence in New Zealand's democracy. We can be a world leader in this area. You know, we're one of the oldest unbroken democracies in the world, 150 years without broken with by civil disturbance or war, uh, internal wars. Uh, we really, really uh, should be holding on to what we have here, which is so precious. I think our system is absolutely wonderful in New Zealand. It lacks some of the checks and balances that you see in other countries like the United States, but their checks and balances have become so unwieldy, their democracy doesn't work. We, on the other hand, have such a simple system, it uh, is even more reliant on being cleaned out by elections if there is a ruling party gets it wrong. So in some ways, our unicameral system, with so much power in the executive attached to the to the parliament, uh, you know, the, the, the party that gains power, I, I really think that we really have to do our utmost to maximise both enrolment and uh, voter turnout at elections.